Okay, hello everybody, we're live. And uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about clinical issues in the treatment of fibromyalgia. So I'm gonna go, it's on. I'm gonna go right ahead and share my screen. So um, I have my faithful servant, <laughs> Avishai, my son, on my Facebook Live page, and he will be feeding questions to me through Facebook Live. If you're on Zoom, you can uh, type any questions you have into the chat. So I'm gonna talk for a little bit, and then uh, I'll answer whatever questions you have. So let's jump right in and screen share. share. So much technology. It's just so much, you know? <laughs> and play the slideshow. Um, Avishai, I need help. Wait, slideshow. Play. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking about clinical issues. I'm going to be going quickly through the introduction because I'm assuming that people who are listening know something about fibromyalgia. Um, now, this webinar is geared towards uh, therapists and other medical or mental health professionals. So I'm not going to go too deeply into the broader concepts because my assumption is that you have some kind of a basis, but I'm gonna go anyway quickly through the beginning parts just for uh, just review sake. So uh, what is fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia is a collection of symptoms the predominant symptom being pain that is unexplained. But there are a lot of other symptoms that are both uh, symptoms of fibromyalgia specifically and comorbid conditions. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but this is just a, a collection of words that are associated with fibromyalgia. It's a nice graphic, but um, we're going to focus on pain. Uh, being the presenting symptom. So this is a chart that has been used since fibromyalgia was first diagnosed in the late 80s, early 90s. And technically, medically, it's diagnosed uh, by the presence of pain in these 18 points. And if you have 11 positive pain points of in these specific places, then that's the basis for the diagnosis. That's sort of a soft diagnosis. So the other aspect of diagnosis is um, it, the process of elimination. Also kind of a soft diagnosis, but what, uh, what the doctors do, and mostly rheumatologists now are in charge of this part of the process, is rule out, it's not rheumatoid arthritis, it's not Lyme disease, it's not lupus, things that have markers. If there are no markers identifiable, then they say, well, we don't know, and so fibromyalgia is what we're going to call it. So it turns out, though, that there are common uh, symptoms that are identified with it. And uh, just um, so you know, I do a lot of my research on Facebook groups. Um, I belong to about 10 different Facebook groups for people with fibromyalgia, and that totals about uh, 200,000 people. So I read these groups every day, and I see that people ask about the same symptoms over and over and over again. So the most common of these symptoms are headaches, are a lot of headaches, uh, a lot of sore throats, a lot of skin uh, rashes, unidentifiable rashes, you know, skin irritations, the skin feels hot to the touch, um, tremendous amount of sleep disorder. I'll get back to sleep disorder. Um, fatigue, obviously, goes along with 
pain. Uh, IBS, tons of IBS also, we'll get back to that. Um, a hypersensitivity to light and sound, TMJ, and fibrofob, which I'm also going to talk about. Uh, a couple more things I want to mention, costochondritis, which is uh, a soreness, spasm of the muscles around the rib cage. It's a very strange symptom, but I have been hearing a lot of people discussing it on the Facebook groups. Um, uh, it's, it can be very painful, this spasm that sort of goes around the rib cage, and people think that they ha are having heart attacks. It, it, it's extremely painful. So um, this is the sort of most common symptom. So in addition to the pain points, I would say that uh, that the doctors would go through not just the process of identifying pain points, but also the overall picture of how does this patient feel? And do they have any of these other sort of uh, complaints, common complaints? Now, I want to, before I get into the next topic about doctors, I just want to say I have been very lucky to not only be treated by some extraordinary doctors, but also to work with, as uh, colleagues, some exceptional doctors. So I don't want you to think that I'm down on doctors. I really have had excellent doctors. But I do see as an observer, in, as I see people coming to my practice for treatment, that there is a lot of less than ideal care. And part of what I'm trying to do here is build a treatment model that takes some of the responsibility off doctors really for that reason. And we'll get to that in a second. So um, because clinical issue number one is that there is a lot of mistrust. So um, when a lot of fibromyalgia patients, by the time they get to therapy, they have been through a process of encountering a medical system that doesn't believe them, doesn't help them, uh, doesn't know what to do, and is dismissive, is um, really negligent, uh, and through no fault of their own. They really don't know what to do. So, um, and there isn't that much they can do, which is why I really would encourage this shift away from the medical model. So uh, this uh, cartoon I threw in here because, right, exactly. I don't like the looks of this at all. There's nothing wrong. A lot of people come to me saying their doctors have said there's nothing wrong but they're suffering terribly. So clearly there is something wrong. And there is this reluctance in the, in the medical side of it for the doctors to say, I don't know how to help you. I don't know beyond this, none of these things are wrong with you and that's good. And beyond that, I don't know how to help you. I don't have uh, a way to treat specifically this pain because I can't identify its source. And it's okay to say that. But it's definitely not okay to tell a person who is suffering terribly, there's nothing wrong with you. So that really creates this mistrust. And by the time this patient comes to the therapist, they already have, you're, you're already one peg down on their respect ladder. So the first step is really to win back their respect by understanding their suffering right away, accepting it at face value. So the medical treatment model that currently exists look like this, in that we have the, the primary care physician at the center and, and the patient. And this is a person who is suffering. Presumably, they've been suffering for some time before they get to the point of diagnosis. And, the, and somehow, the patient is supposed to interact with a lot of different professionals with the primary care physician uh, organizing or referring to or managing different forms of treatment. So this has some inherent issues right here. Uh, one of them is that the primary care physicians are really overwhelmed and under supported and, uh, and, 
and don't have the resources really or the time to manage a case that's this complex. Fibromyalgia is very complex. It involves a lot of different sy systems, not just the neurological system, but all kinds of things. So how can a primary care physician who has 10 or 15 minutes in an appointment really effectively manage all the types of intervention that need to happen to get a person from where they are to a point of wellness. So another aspect of this that's problematic is that the patient is compromised in other ways that I'm going to talk about that make it very difficult for them on their own to pursue any of these things that they're told to do. Uh, so um, let alone tracking and understanding the side effects that are caused by the medications, with, of which there are many. And I see people on the Facebook groups complaining about side effects a lot. Um, and uh, so they, they suffer side effects, they go off the medications, they don't tell anybody except their friends on Facebook, and that already is a problem. Um, and just already getting uh, information about their medical care from Facebook is already problematic. Uh, and the, the other people on Facebook are very willing to give over their uh, non-professional advice about what they should be taking. So uh, we don't want to give over the management of this condition to Facebook because that is a terrible idea. Uh, but we definitely would like to shift some of the responsibility off of the um, medical community. So. Uh, let me back up a second by saying that um, we're dealing with a condition that is extremely common and uh, the World Health Organization estimates that 6% of the world population has fibromyalgia. It, that just is an astounding number. Let, just think about that for a second. If we're, the medical system is completely overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients, which is actually a tiny percent of the world population, and fibromyalgia is 6% of the population. This is a lot of ill people. Now, it's not contagious, okay, but it still requires a lot of attention that the medical systems are not set up to accommodate. Um, so let's move on. So this model is what we have now, and it's not great. So that brings me to clinical issue number two, which is there's a lot of mismanagement. The average fibromyalgia patient is taking multiple medications, psychiatric medications, antidepressants, uh, all kinds of pain medications, things that they are taking without anyone else knowing, herbs, cannabis, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, um, vitamins, supplements, there are all kinds of things you can go and, and on the internet and find vitamins and supplement products that say this is for fibromyalgia. Um, and I, do their doctors know they're taking this? Probably not. But the point is that the, the issue that there isn't one central person who knows everything that's going on uh, is a clinical issue that I believe can be addressed in therapy and should be addressed in therapy, uh, where there is a, a greater likelihood that these, um, that all of the different avenues of care can be centralized and managed. Which brings us to the next uh, issue, clinical issue number three, which is addiction. Now, we know that there is a problem with opioid, narcotic abuse, misuse, and addiction. And yet, I still see people being prescribed opioid narcotics for fibromyalgia pain. Uh, with extreme cases of pain, it seems that doctors run out of ideas uh, and prescribe uh, opioids. And because of this lack of management, there are issues of addiction. Um, I just saw a message posted in one of the groups by a woman who said she carries oxycodone around in her purse because she can't ever remember if she took it or not. 
So we'll talk more about that when we get uh, further down the list. But this is a very dangerous situation. Um, I have a colleague who has a child, an adult child with fibromyalgia, whose doctor prescribed uh, opioids. And he just never followed up on managing the prescription and then said, oh, no, he's addicted nearly a year later. It, it is a, a terrible situation. So we want to, uh, if this is something that may need to be addressed when a person already comes to in therapy, um, if it's not, it can be avoided. One of the ways that we can address both the mismanagement and uh, the addiction issue is with the team approach. I'm a big advocate of this. The primary care physician, the therapist, and the psychiatrist all talking to each other because they share uh, treatment uh, paradigms and treatment issues. There's crossover. So all of these things can be treated together in a team. Um, and uh, so I have had a lot of success with this, working closely with other team members. And it really benefits the patient because also, it allows me not to feel so alone in, um, in trying to organize the treatment, but it also helps the primary care physician and the psychiatrist to feel supported, knowing that someone else is looking and that then we can share information. Um, it's also a way of kind of, uh, of, of tightening the hold on the patient so they can't bounce from one to the other uh, saying, well, this isn't working, and so you try this, and no, I tried this, and not really being clear about what the path to treatment is. So uh, another issue is that, uh, the, that fibromyalgia patients um, often will have a very low level of executive functioning. They have trouble making decisions like uh, getting up out of bed and taking a shower. Um, they have a hard time gauging how they feel. And so they don't know how much activity to pursue or how um, different activities affect their pain or other symptoms. Um, and this is really troublesome, but is an excellent therapeutic issue to address. Uh, that if you can focus on going through, taking the person through a series of choices, of decisions that they need to make for their self-care, um, then you have a much greater uh, likelihood of a positive outcome. So the first thing that I do is really address, do you set an alarm? What time do you get out of bed? How much time is there between the time you wake up and the time you get out of bed? Uh, where are your medications? Do you have a system for knowing? what time you take your medications or what uh, activities are associated with the taking of the medication. Is there food? Um, you know, organizing a schedule to just increase the level of, uh, uh, on that level, executive functioning so that once they then have a healthier overall outlook, that there is something that is containing and driving their um, their overall health. Uh, issue number five is anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety in, uh, in fibromyalgia. Um, so I want to just say that you can distinguish between what is a fibromyalgia symptom and what is a comorbid condition. Anxiety is something that kind of straddles both of those things. It's, if it's severe, Anxiety, then it needs its own plan and maybe psychiatric intervention. Um, if it's mild anxiety that just goes with having a lot to manage in terms of pain, then I would say it's a fibromyalgia symptom. So, but anxiety makes pain worse, as we know, triggering this fight or flight reflex. And a lot of what I do in clinical setting is to try to undo the fight or flight reflex um, to bring calm and uh, encourage the calming the thoughts, calming the body, calming the breath, undoing anxiety. 
um, this is where CBT can be really effective. So this is something that is uh, on the um, on the clinical schedule often. Depression is another aspect of a, another feature that is sometimes just a little depression, a mild depression that is a symptom and sometimes needs its own plan. Uh, there is a, a very high rate of depression among fibromyalgia patients, especially really any chronic illness, chronic pain is depressing. And uh, so it needs to be treated. Now, there are some, there is some use of SNRIs that seem to, in some patients, help this nerve pain. Um, the, on the Facebook groups, they talk a lot about Cymbalta, which is in that category. And if it treats uh, depression, that's good too. But it does seem to come with a lot of um, really difficult side effects for a lot of patients. And so there's a lot of talk about, um, my doctor wants to put me on Cymbalta. How was it for you guys? <laughs> and then here comes the, the crowd to say, well, um, you know, I have all of these side effects from Cymbalta, so I quit. Uh, so this needs a lot more management. Um, obviously, depression is just an obvious, an obvious outcome of chronic pain. So that will be something that you'll address clinically. Uh, and um, it does get better. So an, is an interesting issue that I've seen and maybe this is anecdotal, I don't know, but I can tell you in just about every case I've treated over you know, nearly 20 years um, that I've been treating specifically fibromyalgia and actually one of my very first cases when I was in graduate school was a woman with rheumatoid arthritis in her spine. And I started in the, in the treatment of chronic pain and illness a very long time ago. And that, that was in the eighties. Uh, I have seen this clinical picture emerge over and over and over. And it's so interesting to me. So people who have fibromyalgia tend to have issues with boundaries. They uh, have a hard time setting boundaries and they have a hard time recognizing when their boundaries have been crossed. So maybe there's some relationship here between uh, a weak boundaries, weak boundaries and pain, allowing emotional pain into the body. I'm just kind of guessing here because I see I've identified this clinical picture and then I see that once I have helped the person to identify and strengthen their boundaries that they get better. So I'm not sure that I have the whole picture here, but um, I just have seen this happen a lot clinically. So it's just something to keep in mind, um, to look for, to become aware of and a place to work on um, if when you are, when you get a lot of resistance with kind of the frontal uh, approach, um, try working on strengthening emotional boundaries and see what happens. Very interesting. So with all chronic illness, um, we see secondary gains. And this is a huge clinical issue. And the good news is that you can address it in a clinical setting whereas no other professional is going to address this. And this is why I am a big advocate of therapy, the therapist as the case manager, because the secondary gains, the emotional secondary gains for staying sick are just, are so present. And um, once, though you in the clinical setting can bring this to the attention of the patient, um, there is where to go with this to help them understand that the, uh, the advantages of being well far outweigh whatever advantages there are for being sick. 
but there will be unconscious material there that you have to uncover. Um, and then you can start the, um, the path to healing, but they will keep coming back. These secondary gains will continue to emerge uh, and need to be addressed. I'm not a trauma specialist, but I will say I see a lot of cases of childhood trauma then uh, presenting uh, in, as fibromyalgia in adults. Um, and I also have been seeing a lot of people talking about post-surgical onset of fibromyalgia. So trauma resulting in, you know, sort of this lingering um, aftermath of trauma affecting the physical, the physical health. Um, specifically, how this translates into how we, we think about fibromyalgia as this sort of um, short circuit in pain perception. I can't put that together, but I'm hoping that at some point we will. So if you are a trauma, trauma specialist, you use trauma-informed therapy, um, I would say that, uh, that expanding your practice to treat people with fibromyalgia is a good direction that um, there is a huge population out there that really needs trauma-informed therapists to help them address the trauma that is still stuck in their body and causing them a lot of physical as well as emotional pain. Uh, so next issue is um, that these people have a lot of cognitive impairment. Um, they call it fibro fog. It's a collection of cognitive symptoms, including memory loss and word recall issues. And uh, it's, it, it makes people, um, high functioning people into low functioning people. Uh, possibly even more than pain, um, fibro fog, I think is one of the most challenging symptoms to address. Uh, maybe the combination of fibro fog and sleep disorder uh, uh, non-restorative sleep being one of the very common uh, symptoms of fibro clearly contributes to this cognitive impairment, the fogginess and distractibility that comes with sleep deprivation. So it needs to be addressed clinically. And um, I would say that it's important to identify if there is sleep uh, disorder in addition and see if treating the sleep disorder helps with the cognitive issues. Relationship stress is inevitable in a person with chronic illness who is in a partnership or relationship with a caregiver, a parent, a child, their relationships are stressed. And as the clinician, you need to be aware that these this issue will have to be addressed again and again. Um, they have a hard time finding um, support people. I mean, really, there's a lot of negativity and a lot of negative thinking that I see. And so, of course, the partners can't possibly perform up to their expectations um, because nothing is good. Everything is terrible and no one is helping them and no one understands them. And um, yeah, and that's how it is. So addressing relationship stress in the clinical setting is crucial. An issue that we don't talk about a lot in therapy is the financial devastation that can be caused by a chronic illness. So I chose this cartoon because um, it says it all. We've run every test we could think of and the results show that you're out of money. I, the it, last study that I read um, said, showed that the average uh, fibromyalgia patient spends $10,000 a year on out-of-pocket costs. That includes medical copay and things that are not covered um, by insurance. That's a very high number. And I think it's possibly even higher. Um, now, bearing in mind that many people with fibromyalgia are too ill to work, and they also get denied social security and, and uh, disability. And 
I see this, I follow these um, discussions on Facebook a lot. People who are really obviously too ill to work and get denied two, three times before they're approved. And in the meantime, I uh, have are in a really very, very serious financial situation. So it's something that clinically really need to, we need to address and keep in mind this causes its own type of suffering. Um, uh, sure, we have a question. I'm gonna stop for a second. Do you think it is a good idea for patients to try to manage their own case? And you or anyone else willing or able to do so? What tools should they have if that is the case? Okay. Um, so the question is, do I think it's a good idea for the patient themselves to manage their own case? Um, so ideally, I think it is not a good idea. Um, but if someone wants to take charge of their own care uh, and can do that, then why not? I would myself am an example of that. I managed my own fibromyalgia and I have been now without symptoms for four years, possibly five. Um, so yeah, it can be done. Um, and um, so we'll, I'll, I'll go back to that in a second that I have, I do have some tools to help with that. So, um, but I want to first uh, just, this is the answer to the original question that I asked, which is who can, who should replace the primary care physician as the manager? And here is the answer, the therapist. And I think that the therapy should be the management in, a, in addition to addressing the therapeutic issues that we've covered, um, managing actually takes care of a lot of issues. So uh, for, an, for example, the doctor might say, I've heard that acupuncture can help. And I have so much respect for doctors who send their patients for acupuncture. Mine did, and I hope yours does too. Um, but there, it requires some follow-up. So if the doctor only sees the patient once a month, say, even less, um, then all of that time happened between the recommendation of the treatment and the next visit. So they come back and say, oh, I tried acupuncture, it didn't help. Who says it didn't help? How many times did you go? How did you feel before? How did you feel after? There's no follow-up. Uh, and uh, also, in addition to that, that just getting the patient out of bed um, to try any kind of treatment, never mind make changes in their diet, exercise, um, meditation, managing stress, managing their medications, uh, just taking them, remembering to take the medication, all of these things require a great deal of management. But the therapist can be in charge of management and get it done. Um, so I want to go back and answer the question that came from the, our viewers that uh, in addition to the book, Solving Fibromyalgia, which is this one, um, that is a, a a lot of what we just talked about, but in more depth, a, and it goes more into the clinical, um, a CBT rollout of the clinical interventions. Um, that's one. Um, but also I have this tracking log that was designed, co-designed with my daughter, uh, Leora, and it is a physical journal tracker where you can uh, write down every day you're assessing your pain, your mood, your, what medications, if you took your medication, how much you slept, what time you went to sleep, what time you woke up, what you ate. Um, and, and in addition, it has these, on every page, it has a little uh, flow chart which, where you can track um, if you were able to take a negative thought and reframe it into a more positive 
thought. And then at the end of every week and every month, it has a place for notes where you can go to your practitioner visits and take notes so that you, when you go to your primary care physician, uh, you have information about what the acupuncturist said, or you have, you go to the therapist and you have information about what the primary care physician said. And, uh, and then everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So this, uh, the tracker, I think, can really, I recommend it for anybody who has chronic illness. I think it's an incredible tool. Um, I also have um, a user's guide. I have a, one guide for practitioners, um, which is here, a guide to tracking for practitioners. And there is an ebook that you get when you buy the tracker that's a user's guide for anybody to use the tracker. And um, so now I will uh, plug my course. Um, I have a 10 module pre-recorded training course, which touches on in depth all of the uh, clinical issues and more also offers uh, some, a lot of therapeutic tools for treating fibromyalgia. You can find that on my website. Uh, fibroconsulting.com. And one more cartoon because I couldn't resist. Uh, Mrs. Jones, I have no clue what's wrong with you. Go home and Google your symptoms. Call me in the morning and we'll go from there. Yeah, that's sort of uh, equivalent, I would say, to uh, getting your medical advice from Facebook groups. Uh, but I do get a lot of information about what people are talking about. Okay. We have... Um, so the app, the tracking app, yes, there will be an app. It's in development right now, and it will be a cross-platform uh, tracking app that will have the same features as the tracker, the everything tracker, that you can do online, and also will have an interactive feature so that uh, the practitioners can directly communicate with the app. Um, I'm not the app developer, <laughs> uh, so I can't really answer your technical questions, but I can tell you that I'm hoping it will be available this summer. Other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, and so if you missed some, I'm going to make it available. And uh, so just send me your email address and I will send you the link. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again. And so that's all, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you.